Hello and welcome to another episode of Ask the Expert. I'm Zach Harold, Multimedia Specialist for the West Virginia University Extension Service Family Nutrition Program. And with me again, I have Dr. Lewis Jett, Horticultural Specialist with the WVU Extension Service. How's it going today, Dr. Jett? Very good. Glad good. to be here. <laughs> It's good to hear. Well, uh, once again, we went to our Facebook audience and asked them to submit their gardening questions. Had a lot of questions about tomatoes, so we're kind of going to make that our theme for today. Um, Cynthia Johnson writes us with this question. Um, she says, I'm okay with getting them, talking about her tomato plants, to germinate and a few inches tall, but they almost always end up wilting over then dying. What do I need to do to make them grow stronger? So do you have any tips in, you know, getting really robust plants out of your seedlings? Well, I, I just think, you know, <clears throat> and with, with tomatoes, uh, you know, I would start them in sort of in a small, you know, a container where you can transplant them into a larger container. And then, you know, when they first, about three weeks after they sprout, you transplant them into a little bit of a larger container and then you plant them a little deeper in that, in that container. That makes the root system bigger. And then you could even actually transplant them into a larger pot beyond that or a container. So uh, if something is, is sprouting or growing and then falling over, um, it's chances are it doesn't have a really great root system. So I just would encourage you maybe to think about transferring them to a larger pot as individual plants, you know, planting them a little deeper, uh, deep, you know, a little deeper on the stem. And the tomato is sort of a unique plant because it produces these adventitious roots or, or roots that are are formed on the stem. So the deeper you bury the stem, the more roots you have. So, um, you know, if they wilt, wilting is, you know, caused by numerous things. I mean, it could be just they don't have a, a good, uh, well-defined root system. I mean, it could be, uh, you can actually have wilting if you overwater. You can, you know, saturate your soil. Uh, roots need oxygen. So if the water is in the soil, to, uh, saturating the soil, that actually cause the roots to shut down and the plant will start wilting. Wilting could be caused by not enough moisture, but you know it's all a number of things that could be happening. Too much, too much temperature, too much light. Um, but I would just recommend, you know, when you when you think about growing tomato, tomatoes from seed, you know, grow them as a transplant as best as you can, and then you could always increase the cell, the plant's uh, container size, up to the point where you're ready to plant them out into the garden, because they like big. Big plants need big yields with tomatoes. So you, the larger the plant is, the larger the yield is going to be when you, when, you, when you harvest it. And as I said, you can just successfully bury them deeper as you repot them, and that'll make the root system of the plant much bigger, and that makes the plant grow better too. Here's a question that we've been getting a lot um, as people are looking toward you know, transplanting those seedlings into the garden. They say, what is your favorite method for supporting tomatoes? I, I guess they mean steaks or cages. And what supplies do I need? That's from Meredith Browning Sterling. Okay. It's a great question. I mean, tomatoes need to be staked. I mean, there's just no debate about it. I mean, they, they just don't grow well if they're, if they're flat on the ground or flat on the surface of the garden. They rot. They get sun burned. Uh, you lose a lot of tomatoes by not staking them. So... <clears throat> So there are several different ways to stake tomatoes, um, and I have different opinions on what works for me. I like to use sort of a, uh, an individual stake or uh, they call a string weave system. When I have several plants in a row, I just put a stake every third plant, and then I run this baling twine or whatever uh, between the plants, and that just holds the plants upright. And um, if, if the uh, gardeners can um, access the web page, the extension web page, um, my um, tomato uh, uh, growing fact sheet describes that trellising method in detail, sort of how you do it. But I mean, you, if you had a couple plants, you know, two or three plants, uh, then I would just individually stake them to um, either a metal T post or a wooden garden stake. But you want the stake to be higher than what the plant will grow. So you, you need a stake that's going to be about 50 inches, 60 inches tall. Um, I've seen tomatoes put in uh, wire cages. That's fine. Um, that's not my preference. I, I, I've never really had great success growing tomatoes in cages. It seems like it, it sort of crowds the foliage all together and sort of makes it harder for the virus to pollinate. But, um, you know, cages are an option for, for some people who may want to do that. 
Um, I've seen tomatoes trellised um, on the um, uh, woven wire fence or cattle panels, what they call cattle panels, you know, that are used to, to um, uh, uh, work with livestock. And, and so if you have something on your farm, you know, if you have a farm that you also have cattle panels, you can, you can, you can train the, the tomatoes to grow up um, a, a panel. But anything that gets them off the ground is going to be really beneficial for disease, preventing disease, making the tomato look better, less rotting, um, and you're going to get higher yield. So, you know, just develop the best method that works for you on, on getting them off the ground on the trucks. And what's the best when you're staking a tomato or, or putting a cage around it or something like that? Do you need to get that in place as soon as the tomato goes in the ground? Or um, what's the timing on that? Well, yeah. So <laughs> timing's everything. So um, I don't stake tomatoes until they, they start flowering. So that usually is about a month after you transplant it. So... Um, you know, you, you could envision a situation where you, you planted your tomatoes maybe a little early and, and maybe you get a cold snap and you want to put a, a frost blanket over them. It's going to be much easier to put the frost blanket over them if they're not on a stake. Um, so normally by the time they're fruiting or starting to flower uh, is well into warm weather and you have low risk of um, having you know, frost or cold weather events, not, or cool weather events in the evening. So, um, I would try to get them on a stake um, at first flowering. And then, you know, if you're using an individual stake for the plant, I mean, you just tie the plant to the, to the stake every six inches up the stake, and that's good enough to hold it to that individual stake. Um, but, um, you know, just don't do it too early. Um, the plant really doesn't need to be vertical uh, until it starts flowering. Here's something I always worry about. Uh, when putting a steak next to a tomato, I'm worried I'm going to hurt the plant. Like <laughs> I'm going to, you know, jab the steak into the into the root system or something like that. Is there a what do I need to do to avoid doing that? Yeah, that's a great point because I actually I used to feel that way too. But um, tomatoes are really tough plants. I mean, they, they they've got they've got great root systems. So you know, you can pound that trellis you know, kind of close to the, the stem even. And, and then the roots will, you know, they'll just, yeah, maybe you'll, you know, uh, clip some of the roots with the, the, the stake, but uh, the plant will uh, adapt and it will just grow more abundant roots around that stake. So don't worry about, you know, root pruning or anything that might happen from the stake. Um, I mean, just obviously don't do any damage to the stem when you're staking it. Try not to, 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 to um, nick the stem or, or damage the stem any. But um, the roots on tomatoes, like I said, are just incredibly vigorous, and um, they, um, and, and, you know, the, the more roots, the better. But but they're able to take a stake right next to the, the plants. So. Well, you've you've put my mind at ease. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> Five years. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Melanie Whittington wrote us and wanted to know what is the best way to prune tomatoes and and pruning tomatoes is is really important to getting a healthy plant right oh absolutely um, so I mean you know most garden plants are pruned to some degree and don't hesitate to prune tomatoes I mean pruning is just the way that you know you as a gardener are trying to control uh, vine growth I mean you know these, these plants if they're not pruned these tomato plants will just get too bushy they'll get too leafy and you know you as a gardener you're trying to control the balance between fruit and leaves so you don't want it to produce too many leaves relative to the amount of fruit so that's why pruning is important for tomatoes and so um it's like most pruning on, on you know grapes and blueberries and things that we, we regularly prune it's a there's a there's a an element of uh, subjective uh, you know uh, decision making with it um, there's no single formula for every tomato plant. Um, I will tell you, personally, as, as a gardener, as a horticulturist, I never prune early season tomatoes. These are tomatoes that, you know, fruit uh, in less than 70 days from transplanting. I almost never prune them because they tend to be smaller plants and they actually need more vegetative growth before they start setting on their tomatoes. But if it's a heirloom variety or it's what they call a mid-season variety, which is something that's 
more than 70 days after transplanting before it starts brooding. Some of these varieties are 80, 85 or beyond. Uh, these are big plants, so they need to be pruned um, as much as, uh, as possible. So the formula that I use for pruning uh, a plant that, you know, we, we do want to plant, uh, we do want to prune that's a tomato of that type, is that we remove the, what they call the, the axillary shoots, or what's called suckers, on the plant from the bottom of the plant. Um, so you really don't know how many to remove until that first flower cluster shows up because if you try to prune, prune them before you see where the flowers are, you may actually end up taking too many off. So what I do is, is, is these, um, these suckers or these shoots, they, they're just new stems that form in the angle between the main stem and the leaf. So I think everybody that's grown tomatoes before probably knows what I'm talking about, but if you haven't grown tomatoes, it'll be pretty obvious to see these, these new shoots coming up in between the axis of the, of the stem and the leaf. And these will, I mean, if they're unpruned, they'll just become another, um, another vine. They'll actually just be another part of the plant that will be, you know, producing a lot of leaves and, and, and some fruit too. But um, what I do is I, I remove those, those suckers um, and leave one below, just leave one below the first flower cluster. So when you identify where the, the tomato plant is going to flower, you know, on the plant, there's going to be a, a sucker or a shoot below that. Keep that one, but remove everything below that. And that will, that will train the plant to produce two stems because it's going to have the main stem of the, of the plant, and then it's going to have this, this shoot below it. So rather than just a ball of vines, which is what will happen if you don't prune some of these varieties, you'll get a plant that's more disciplined and, and is not you know, over, overcrowded with leaves and it will actually make your fruit um, ripen faster earlier because the plant's not using all of its energy to produce vines, it's using it to produce fruit um, when you do the pruning. So um, that's pruning in, 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 in what we call the classic sense. Now there's also pruning that's done later in the season when um, you have an indeterminate tomato, you know, which is a tall vining tomato. And this is something that's continuing to produce flowers and leaves throughout the year. It'll keep, it'll keep doing it until frost. Well, at some point you run out of time, your gardening days are winding down, let's say in early September, and the plant's still trying to flower uh, and try to produce tomatoes. What well, doesn't know any different? It just seems that you know, warm days are gonna continue for forever. So you can hedge the plant at the top. That's a, that's a top pruning. So you can just cut the, you know, cut the top of the plant off and force it to, to ripen the tomatoes that it has already set. Because you need about 45 days from flowering to, to ripen a tomato. So if you're, you know, less, if you have less days than that between your next frost event, <laughs> you're, it's better to just, you know, top the tomato plant. And that's a form of pruning too. So, um, and then the third type of pruning that we do, um, and again, this is for real leafy, big varieties, is we take the lower leaves of the plant off as they start turning yellow. So there's leaves on tomatoes that are kind of close to the ground. These eventually will start dying off and they become sort of um, uh, substrate, if you will, for uh, early blight. So sort of deleafing those lower leaves that are right next to the ground later on when the plant's fruiting will help control early blight on it. But I think the main thing is just, you know, um, prune it to two stems, like I mentioned earlier. This is also discussed in my um, tomato uh, uh, production fact sheet for home gardeners and for, for, um, for commercial growers as well. Because commercial growers do the same thing. They prune tomatoes because they're trying to do the same thing. And, um, but you want to take these, these suckers off before they get much longer than four inches. I, I would not prune them off when they're, you know, eight, 10 inches, because they can just grow a, a new stem. And so you want to prune them when they're small, so you can pinch them off with your hand. You really don't want to come in there with a pruning knife or or um, uh, clippers and do it. And then you can actually reroot those and make new plants out. So they're, they're, you know, tomatoes are easy to propagate. So you could just stick those suckers into a potting mix and that'll make a new plant. So, you know, you can plant tomatoes up to early July in most parts of West Virginia. So if you, if you repot those suckers before early July, you can have another crop of tomatoes for your uh, fall uh, harvest. So that's a really cool thing about tomatoes is you can just propagate from them and just keep getting tomatoes for the rest of the year. 
Yeah, nobody's going to complain about that. Free free tomatoes. <laughs> Not plants or anything. You just you just doing your own producing your own plants from your your mother plants, if you will, that you have there uh, in the garden. So it's really cool. Well, we're we're still a little ways off from actually being able to pick uh, tomatoes, but we we got a question here with an eye toward uh, harvesting. Jessica Lease wants to know. Um, what is the best tomato to use for canning or making pasta sauce? Oh. Well, yeah, I mean, um, I think if you want to make a sauce out of a, of a, out of a tomato, you need a Roma type tomato, which is uh, a paste tomato. And my favorite, uh, my, my two favorite Roma tomatoes are San Marzano, which is an Italian heirloom, which is incredible. And actually it's, it's a sweet, um, it's actually a sweet sauce um, uh, un, uh, tomato. It has a, really a sweet flavor to it. And then the Amish paste is, is very popular in the state. So that, it's a larger, the Amish paste is a larger Roma tomato than the um, San Marzano. But uh, uh, there are other, there are other uh, paste tomatoes that I'm sure that maybe other folks have tried, but those are my two favorite. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's easier than trying to take a slicing tomato and making a sauce out of it is to start out with a aroma, aroma tomato. And can you explain a little bit um, the difference between, like, the difference between a cherry tomato and a slicer tomato is easy enough size, but, like, what it is about a paste tomato that makes it um, more conducive toward sauce making as opposed to a slicer tomato that you'd put on your sandwich or, or whatever? Is it the seed? Is it the flesh inside? What What is it that differentiates those two varieties? It's... it's solids is what they call soluble solids on it are higher which means there's less there's less water there's less gel uh there's more there's just more meat to it if you will so it, it, you get more you just get more sauce because you're not getting a lot of just water from the, the from the tomato itself so um yeah i mean uh there are excellent varieties of aromas I, just going back to our earlier discussion about trellising probably the only tomato i would possibly consider not trellising would be aroma because they have such tough skin that they can actually lay on the ground they'd be okay but if you didn't you know if you didn't want to trellis it you know if you felt you didn't have time or whatever and you're growing aroma tomato they should be okay with a mulch you know not laying on bare ground but just kind of laying on a mulch you know kind of straw hay uh, wood chips uh, you know plastic whatever and not being trellised um, because they're sort of a real sprawling plant and they're kind of they're kind of tricky to get up on a trellis sometimes because they're, they're so, they have so many different limbs and, and they're not, they're not real uh, compact plants. So they're, they may, they may be suitable for something that can be put in a cage or just laying flat on the ground without being trellised up on a, a string or a, a stake. I didn't realize that you, Romans could, uh, you could just let them, let them go uh, without staking them up. Probably still a, like a good idea though, right? For disease prevention or... I think just, just right, exactly, Zach. I, I think just, you know, maybe just getting in the habit of, of trellising tomatoes, all tomatoes is, is, is good. Um, I mean, you know, if nothing else, it just makes it easy, easier to pick them, you know, if you don't have them laying flat on the ground. It's just much easier to have people to, people to pick them and it's easier to pick, so yeah. We had a couple questions about splitting. Um, another question from Jessica Lee, she says, how do you prevent tomatoes from splitting at the top? And then Rihanna Adgin Smith wrote and said, last year we had issues with splitting on the bottom. What causes this? What is the remedy? Yeah, uh, I'm gonna say splitting and cracking. They're probably saying the same thing. Um, we see splitting on tomatoes in greenhouses. I'm not sure that's what they're describing, but the cracking is, you know, unique uh, to garden tomatoes because um, it's, it's a problem with some varieties more than others. Um, well, there are several ways to handle this. Probably the easiest way to, to deal with the cracking is um, controlling the watering. I mean, because tomatoes um, tend to uh, expand and contract with water and that's what causes the, the, uh, the fruit to crack. So if you're, even watering. I mean, if you're just, you know, doing everything you can so they're not getting a lot of water at one time and then they're letting, letting them dry out, 
uh, and then you water them again. You know, don't do that. I mean, you need to even water tomatoes. I mean, that's, that doesn't mean watering them every day, but that means, you know, thorough watering every other day or every, every third day, and making sure they're getting enough rainfall if possible. But I mean, the way to solve that too is just mulching them. I mean, just making sure that, that they're well mulched. You know, mulching reduces uh, water evaporation from the soil. So if there's less water evaporation from the soil, the plant's not going to need to be watered as much. And that's, like I said, that usually it's erratic watering, too much, too little. That's what triggers cracking or splitting. I'll say splitting uh, maybe is a synonymous uh, word here. But, um, uh, and then I kind of mentioned earlier, there's differences in varieties with, with, with cracking <clears throat> as well. Um, I grow a mortgage lifter, lots of mortgage lifters, which is a, uh, uh, a West Virginia heirloom, and there's some varieties of mortgage lifter um, strains, if you will, that are that have lots of problems with cracking. The heirlooms do because they have such thin skin, and that causes them to to split or crack real, relatively easy. But there, you know, if you if you go to some of the hybrids like um, um, Celebrity, Celebrity has um, uh, Celebrity Supreme is crack resistant. It's, Celebrity is an excellent tomato. It's a garden tomato. It's an All American selection winner. Um, but it's very crack resistant and you get a really nice slicing tomato from that. So you may want to, you know, just sort of peruse the seed catalogs and, you know, they'll often mention, hey, this is crack resistant, but, but the celebrity is um, as well. Um, I tell you, if you're seeing, normally cracking is seen on the top of the tomato. Um, and if you're seeing something on the bottom, um, I'm not sure that's cracking as much as it might be just what we call blossom end rot which is when the tomato also is getting erratic water. <laughs> so there could be, you know, two things going on there at the same time, which is not uncommon with um, most plants. Um, so the blossom end rot is, a, is caused by also not having even watering because it's a calcium deficiency. And calcium moves into tomato plants by water. And if there's no water, there's no calcium, and then you see um, blossom end rot. So, you know, just to make life easier for everybody. I mean, just, you know, kind of just starting out from the beginning, doing the best things you can, and that's mulching and even watering. So just kind of control that as much as you can. And that probably will solve that. If you like to grow heirloom varieties, which I do, you know, you may have to suffer through the, uh, the cracking, but uh, you can sort of mitigate it a little bit by uh, having a little bit more balanced watering. Uh, but you may still see some cracking on some of the heirloom varieties, but you can reduce it by not having this up and down water. We received several questions about blight. Um, Stephanie Strib wrote in and asked, how often should tomatoes be watered? I've heard that they do not need to be watered when they start to droop as overwatering can lead to blight. Is this true? Tomatoes are, you know, they take a lot of water because of the tomato fruit itself is 96% water. So, I mean, you know, there's a, there's a direct relationship between water and how big your tomato gets sometimes. So um, this is where it gets a little tricky <laughs> because, uh, you know, tomatoes, I mean, if you're growing them outside, obviously in the garden, you're going to have natural rainfall. So, you know, you need about an inch and a half to, of rain per week for tomatoes, two inches at the most. So, I mean, you know, uh, you may or may not have a rain gauge or you may not know what kind of rainfall you're getting, but if you're getting less than that, then you will need to water the tomatoes. But, but I mean, if they're well mulched, they're, go they're not going to need a lot of supplemental watering. So, you know, and uh, we recommend for tomatoes, you know, people use uh, soaker hoses or, or drip tape, drip irrigation tape, which is bottom watering. So whenever you're just thinking about watering tomatoes, um, don't water them from the top. I mean, don't get the leaves wet, but water them from the bottom through a drip system or a uh, soaker hose. But that's only if, like I said, you're not getting enough natural rainfall. So that's, you know, where you might uh, need to, to, to make sure that you're getting enough uh, natural to do it. So the way to water tomatoes is rather than water them every day, let's say you're in a drought period and it's dry, it's not getting any, any rainfall, is just give them one good thorough watering every other day or every third day. Don't don't give them light waterings every day. So, and that's you can you can you can take that also to every plant. I mean, 
you want to have extensive root systems. If you just lightly water a plant, it will only form roots where the water is, and you won't have a big root system because it's just, you know, you're just wetting the surface of the soil. So you want to give them a good, thorough watering when you do watering. So tomatoes take as much as a gallon of water per day per plant. I mean, that's not meaning again, you have to water them every day, but that's when they have a fruit load. Okay, when they're, you know, they're picking and they've got lots of green fruit on them, they're probably going to need a gallon of water a day. When it's, when it's, you know, kind of a early plant, a quart of water per day, you know, or, you know, that's, it's, it's, that's real, you know, sort of rough, but, but I think if you're thinking about how much water do we need to put on tomatoes, that's about what they need. Um, and uh, like I said, plant them as deep as you can, you plant them to have a big root system, that's going to help them water uptake. Um, and, um, but, um, yeah, just kind of mulch them as, as thick as you can, and, and that will help conserve soil moisture. Chris Yoskovich Byrne um, asks, how to stop or prevent blight? So blight, I'm, I'm just assuming that's sort of generic for early blight. Uh, there could be late blight, but, and there's septoria leak spot um, that I think we mentioned uh, during the last, uh, uh, ask uh, the expert session. Which you know, I'm not an I'm not a pathologist, but yeah, water wet leaves means you're going to have more uh, diseases. So yeah, bottom watering is going to solve that issue. Um, so remember earlier I mentioned about um, taking the lower leaves off the plant. That helps because early blight uh, comes from the soil splashed up onto the leaves from the rain. So if you have bare soil, you know that's a problem. But if you have um, the lower leaves that are close to the soil and they're getting that rain soil splashed up on them, that's going to trigger that early blight. So deleafing those lower leaves, you know, is going to help. And then you have the option of whether you want to use a spray, um, which, you know, is entirely viable option because a lot of the fungicides that are labeled for tomatoes are benign products. I mean, they're really very safe to use. Um, but if you go to a local garden center, you can find a product called Dacanil, D-A-C-O-N-I-L, and that's common, you find it at most garden centers. And then you start spraying that every week to 10 days after flowering, and you just keep spraying it. That will shield the plant from getting blight, okay? Um, now, you, there's organic products um, that can be labeled or used as well. I mean, probably the easiest and simplest to find would be liquid copper. Most garden centers have that too. But um, so there are spray options that um, gardeners can use. Um, but it's, there's no single um, uh, approach to it to solve all these, the issues with blight. There's, uh, but I think you know, just having good cultural practices and if you want to uh, spray um, these fungicides that will help control them. And then the, the pruning that we mentioned earlier is going to improve air circulation in the plant. That'll, prevent a lot of disease issues. And then you may want to space your plants 30 inches apart or 36 inches apart. Um, don't space plants, tomato plants, uh, 15 or 18 inches apart. Just go at least 24, 30, 36. Those are typical spacings for garden tomatoes. So. Mary Kathleen Wilkinson wrote in and said, please also take on the rumors of fixes. Uh, none of us can afford to lose a season of work to ripe rot. So, Dr. Jett, are there any old wives' tales that uh, our, our folks need to watch out for? Well, yeah, don't spray, yeah, don't spray your, your tomato plants with bleach. That's not, that's not, that's not, I don't know how many times I hear that, but yeah, don't, don't, don't mix Clorox into a, into a water mixture and spray them. That's, that's not going to work. Don't spray your soil with bleach. That's another thing. I mean, I hear people want to spray their soil with, with um, bleach. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, that's what I commonly hear. I'm sure there's some other products. Um, I mean, I've used compost tea before and it's a great product. I mean, it's, it's great. You know, I make it, I, I bought it or uh, had gardeners give me compost tea and I've, I've used it. Um, I've never had it successfully used, uh, used for controlling diseases, um, but it's an excellent fertilizer. But I often hear that a lot, using compost tea, spraying the leaves with compost tea. I, you know, um, I haven't read or looked at all the other options, but uh, I mean, I think just sound, you know, good gardening practices 
you know, that's going to, that's going to be successful. I don't look for a quick fix. You know, obviously if something is, is too good to believe, it probably is. <laughs> so, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go for anything that's uh, sold as a product that completely cures blight. I mean, a lot of this, you know, food production, um, you know, growing your own food, it's hard work. I mean, it's, it is, I mean, but it's good hard work. So, I mean, you don't, you don't expect these plants to just miraculously produce food without any work and any attention. So, you know, just, you're going to love it. I mean, you're going to love growing these plants. They're going to, they're going to reward you with food and, and just really, you know, it's going to, it's going to make you feel great, but there's no quick fix. There's no quick solution to some of these problems other than just, you know, following the best practices that we recommend for, for growing these, um, these vegetables, these fruits, these herbs, these flowers that we love to see people grow. Well, Dr. Jett, thank you for joining us again for Ask the Expert. Zach, I appreciate it. Well, we, we certainly it. appreciate you and, and your expertise, and I'm sure we'll be calling you up again here sometime soon, maybe for one of our other crops. <laughs> Will do. There's a lot of crops to grow out there. <laughs> well, thank you so much, and uh, I hope you um, hope we don't get any more frosts. Amen. <laughs> Till yep. next time, we'll, we'll see. See, you. see you. Bye. All right. We hope you all join us next time too. In the meantime, you can send any of your gardening-related questions to the Grow This Facebook page, which, if you haven't already, give it a like. We do regular challenges and, and give away prizes. You can interact with other gardeners on there, or you can just post a photo and, and show us how your garden's growing. We'd love to see it. So until next time, I'm Zach Harold, Multimedia Specialist with the WVU Extension Service, Family Nutrition Program. Have a good rest of your day.